three, two, one. We have a new NBA champion. Here we go. It is an absolute honor and a privilege to have one of the true legends of our time join me for an interview. A man who has achieved a great deal on the hardwood as well as off the court in the field of academia. Dr. Dick Barnett is a two-time NBA champion with our New York Knicks. Known as one of the unsung heroes of that 1970 championship team. Also winning a championship with the Knicks in 1973. An NBA All-Star. He also holds a PhD from Fordham University, a longtime teacher at St. John's University in the field of sports management. Dr. Dick Barnett joins us today. Dr. Barnett, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today, sir? It's great to be with you. Uh, looking forward to uh, uh, speaking with many of the fans of, of the New York Knicks. Absolutely, sir. Thanks again for joining us. And and starting with your, your early career, you picking up the game started with a ping pong balls and a tin can. Is that true? Can you elaborate on that? Uh, that that's true. And really, as I look back on it, uh, it really helped me with, with my balance and, and, and with my touch. You grew up in Gary, Indiana. And as you matriculated through the game, you would attend, you, you had some epic duels with Oscar Robinson. You would end up attending Tennessee A&I, which became Tennessee State University. At, at what point did you realize you were going to go all the way and pursue a career in the NBA? At what point did you feel like you were good enough to make it? Um, well, I, I was like uh, most young black men at that time, and I wanted to uh, try to get to the NBA. And basically what, what transpired over the years, my uh, uh, abilities on the playground became known at the uh, Roosevelt High School in Gary. And they, uh, they marvel, they say, well, if, if you can put a ping pong ball in a tin cup, you, you should be able to do something with a basketball. And, and really my career really took off after that. And going to Tennessee State, and young people really can't appreciate that. I was at Tennessee State in, in the midst of uh, the grip of segregation. Maybe you have read about yeah. George Wallace, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the White Citizens Council, uh, Lester Maddox, uh, all of that comparable uh, to the Proud Boys uh, of, of today's era, where every young black male's life was in jeopardy, just walking the streets of Nashville, Tennessee. I played in an era where there was no public accommodation. There were white signs and black signs to use the public restroom. So all of that was transpiring. I really didn't want to leave that out because it's so relevant to what is happening today with Black Lives Matter. They have taken, taken up the baton of what we were doing 50 years ago and, and trying to uh, uh, regain their person heal, personhood and humanity like we were, okay? Basketball was certainly your passion, but did you also feel like it was sort of an escape from that reality where outside of the court, you're viewed as sort of less than human, you know, less rights, less privileges than others? Did you sort of <laughs> view the game as, as an escape? Well, well, it, it was an escape, but, but yeah, you got to understand in those days, and uh, particularly as a black athlete, uh, many thought that all, all you were capable of was running, jumping, and competing. And they, they didn't think that you could uh, enter a, a classroom on a academic basis and, 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 and pursue your dreams beyond basketball in that manner. And, and, and if I could, can, can I uh, tell the, the Knicks fan, perhaps they've heard this before. 
I, I went to the court when I was in high school. Yeah. I went to the court every day, honing my skills so I could make them pay. Yeah. There were no off days and time to relax my mood. And my touch had to be exact. Four to five hour cases that I put in, rain, sleet, and snow was part of the toe. At the end of this ritual, my game was bad. My skills were complete. Everybody could be had. <laughs> I was the talk and toast of the town, handshakes, publicity, and offers abound. But my dedication had a regrettable flaw. My classwork was shoddy, and it was mostly my fault. So let me, let, let me tell you what really changed my life around mm -hmm. playing basketball. One of the most fortunate things that happened to me, and, 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 and it seems counterproductive, but it was very positive. I ruptured my Achilles tendon. The chickens came home to roost at Madison Square Garden, October the 12th, 1967, when I ruptured my Achilles tendon and they took me to the dressing room, Casey, and the doctor said, you might not ever play any more professional basketball. Mm -hmm. And I said, and he said, push my, my, my finger with your toe and I couldn't move my, my, uh, I, I couldn't move my foot. He said, well, we're gonna have to operate on you Tuesday, and that changed my life. Before, basketball was my mistress. Hmm. Education became my lifelong romance after that. And so with that, is, is that how you pursued uh, you know, academic excellence with that same vigor that you pursued excellence on the court? No, no, no question about it. I went back to school and got a, a uh, and, and I, I, I'm, an, I'm not a graduate of Tennessee State. I went back to school in the summer and, and received my bachelor's degree from Cal Poly of Pomona. I received my uh, master's degree from New York University and I received my doctorate degree from Fordham University. And what I wanted was an opportunity to be in the classroom like everybody else and prove that academically, I was as sharp as anyone else. All right. Now, now you've been able to accomplish so much both on the court and off. Uh, Hall of Fame in Tennessee, Indiana, Collegiate Hall of Fame, two-time NBA champion. As you said, a master's degree from NYU, doctor's degree from Fordham. Uh, what would you say was is your greatest achievement in, in life? Well, my, my, my greatest achievement in life was having the opportunity to uh, change uh, the perspective of my family and when I came to the NBA. Obviously, we were not making the generational wealth mm -hmm. that they're making today. Mm -hmm. But it, it was an opportunity I had never thought about. Uh, that There was no uh, history of, of, of people going to graduate school in my family. In Gary, Indiana, it was a steel mill city. And basically, you finish high school. If you did, you went to the steel mills of Gary. This was a new situation in, in my life altogether. So one of the things that I determined at that point, I, wa I wanted to do something different with my life and really follow my dreams. And I've been on a dream paradigm 
every sense and what I call a dream paradigm, which has five principles to, to that paradigm. Mm -hmm. the, the, the first principle is, is, is commitment. You've got to be, to, to follow your dreams and I always say to young people, never say no. Mm -hmm. Never say no to your dreams. The five C's, commitment every day, consciousness. As a black man in America, I understood without public accommodation and the issues of race in America, uh, I understood what that meant. So I developed what I call the dream paradigm, mm -hmm. consciousness commitment, conviction, courage, and control. Following those principles every day, reinforcing uh, my dream uh, to, to, to never give up hope in terms of what I wanted to achieve in life. And then ultimately taking that paradigm out to young people because there have been so many blood, sweat, and tears mm -hmm. for me to get where, and I stand on a number of people's shoulders. Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, Fannie Lee Hamer, a number of people we stand on the shoulders to carry this forward. And now we're, we're in, the, in, in the midst of George Floyd and his trial. What would you say, and, and, and you mentioned some legendary figures of, of that time, especially in the sports world, you know, you had Bill Russell, your, your counterpart, Jim Brown, and Ali being so outspoken during that time. It seems like the, the generation after that, the Jordans and the Magics maybe shied away a little bit, maybe fearful <laughs> of being ostracized or losing endorsements and, and hurting the brand. But it seems like today's athlete now, as we switch gears to LeBron and Carmelo Anthony, D Dwayne Wade, it seems like they're willing to be a bit more outspoken and, and, and come out and, and take a stand. What would you say to today's athlete in terms of how they should be participating in, in, in activism? Well, well I, I, I admire what they're doing. And also I admire uh, what the, uh, the commissioner, the, the commissioner has done. He's taken up the uh, the link of what uh, David Stern had done thirty years before, and Adam Silver has taken up that and gone steps ahead. So, uh, in, in the bubble, Black Lives Matter was everywhere, and and that's where how it should be. Those are the uh, of, of the real issues that have to be confronted, particularly with voting and all the other issues that are on the table today. The, in fact, democracy uh, is, is, is in jeopardy with, with a number of things transpiring. On the, the 1970 championship team, a lot of fans or, or historians would, would call you one of the unsung heroes, one of the underappreciated teammates on that team. But they also consider that 1970 team the ultimate team. What did you feel like your role was on that team to help them win it? Well, my, my role was just, you know, just, just to perform as I had always performed. You know, I was, uh, you know, I, I was a consistent scorer, played defense, and uh, everybody on, on the team at that time, Clyde, uh, DeBusher, Willis, uh, you know, we, every, everybody could, everybody could work together. We had guys coming off the bench, Kathy, Kathy Russell, my Mike Ridden, uh, uh, Dave Stallworth. Uh, we, we had a number of guys that made a substantial contribution to what, uh, New York basketball was, was all about at that particular time. When, when we look at Willis Reed's epic 
come back and come out of the tunnel in game seven. Do you remember what you, what you felt like, how, how you felt or the, the overall atmosphere of Madison Square Garden? Well, uh, we, we, we knew that Willis was, if he could walk, uh, he was going to play. So, uh, so we, we, we were not astounded uh, at, 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 because he came, uh, obviously, he, he played a tremendous positional defense on on Will and and now I, I think if I if I recall I, I think uh, Willis made the first two baskets. He did. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, he, he, is that right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he made the first two baskets. I, I don't think he scored after that, but he didn't need to. Clyde had a a a, a world beating game at that particular time. Uh, so you know it was something that uh, we had been trying to achieve. Uh, for years, and when the Boston Celtics dominated uh, professional sports and professional basketball, obviously with uh, Bill Russell and Sam Jones and Howard Check and uh, uh, KC, I mean, they did, and, and all of that, obviously, it was a great coach uh, for the Boston Celtics. Speaking of Clyde, he he noted you as as his idol when he came to the Knicks. Uh, what was your relationship like with Clyde, and and how was he as as the floor general of, of those teams? No, our relationship was great. Yeah, in, in fact, I, I think Clyde could appreciate. I I was about almost uh, uh, not quite ten years older than 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 Clyde, and obviously, I was I was very. Uh, uh, holistic, you might say, in, in taking care, care of myself physically, trying to stay in shape, never uh, smoking or mm-hmm. taking drugs or, or that kind of stuff, just taking care of your body. And, and, and I, I told Clyde, you know, this is what, this is what you need to do. You, you're, you're all, you already have the tools to be a great player and, and you, you'll be around a long time taking care of yourself and, and, and uh, uh, work, working with others. And, and obviously that, that's what transpired. Uh, when, when you won the championship in 1970, over the course of that time, even, even prior to it, there was so much happening in the world. You, you had the Vietnam War and so many leaders beca- assassinated between JFK, MLK, uh, Malcolm X, you know, Fred Hampton, Medgar Evers, and so on. Did you feel like you, you accomplished much more given the divide that was going on outside of, of the court? Well, we, 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 we understood what was happening outside uh, of, of basketball out in, in the real world. Uh, particularly uh, once uh, Dr. King uh, uh, was assassinated, e- even before that, when uh, president the president was assassinated in Dallas, mm-hmm. you know. So the the sixties was uh, a, a a a a decade of turmoil mm-hmm. uh, from from Jump Street. Okay, so. The, the, those are some of the things that we had to deal with. We, we understood that. And, and let, let me give the Nick audience something else to chew on. Mm-hmm. When we won uh, three consecutive uh, NAIA championship, and people say, what, what is the uh, NAIA uh, what what does that stand for? That is the forerunner of, of the NCAA tournament and the NIT. The first year when we won the NAIA, uh, our coach, Don McLennan, legendary coach, he was at the elbow of Naismith in Kansas. Okay, he went to Kansas. Mm-hmm. He was at the old boy of Naismith. So uh, John Mike Lennon said, we want to play Bill Russell. And, and you have 
We want to play them, NCAA. We petition to play in the NCAA. Mm. They say, well, you can't come to the NCAA. We've never had a all black team mm. at Madison Square Garden. Okay, so we went back the following year. We went back the following year to the NAIA and won it for the second straight year. And uh, we have petitioned again to come to the NIT at Madison Square Garden. And the garden said, we don't accept black team at Madison Square Garden. So we went back for the third time. The first team to win a national championship in college basketball history. And we won it without public accommodation. We had to relieve ourselves in cornfields. We couldn't go into restaurants. We couldn't sleep in hotels. We couldn't do any of those things. They said, nigga, you don't have any place here, okay? Mm. That was the world that we were living in. The world that young people today understand when they deal with Facebook mm -hmm. and, and, and all and, and those type of platforms. We had to live the real world. The real world when Dr. King had to go to jail and the jailer come in and said, your first name is nigga. Your, your, your second name is boy. So, you know, those were the issues that we had to deal with. The second time we won the championship, we got on the plane coming to Nashville, Tennessee. They had called up and said, in Kansas City, a bomb has been put on that airplane. You better come back to Kansas City as quickly as you can. The airplane pilot said, as soon as we hit the ground, don't go for your baggage or anything. We've got to get out and slide down and get out of here as quickly as we can. When we did get out, and get back to Nashville, a bus was waiting on us to go to downtown Nashville to sit in, to sit in so we could stand up for the Constitution uh, of the, that the forefathers who owned slaves and couldn't live up to their own words. So, you know, those are the things that I like to talk about because the, it, it, it becomes part of what I call the dream paradigm. Let your hopes and dreams take, to, take you to where you want to go. And what, what I love about America, the writing, the Constitution, all of it is great, but we have so much for farther to go until we achieve what, what, uh, what we really want to achieve. And it seems like th those times, uh, those times of, of great adversity was, was a source of strength for you, right? In, in pursuing, no, no, no your, question in about pursuing your dreams. I, I had a, un, un, unquenchable, a unquenchable thirst to live my dream, a unquenchable thirst to live my dream. And that's what has transpired. I still have dreams. And one of, one of the major dreams I have, there's the Dr. Richard Barnett Foundation. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and we're dealing with sports. We're dealing with business. We're dealing with education and technology. To, uh, and really talking to young people and trying to inspire them to live their dream as we hand that baton off to them. So we, we're, we're looking to do a number of things. I've been in contact with 
uh, President Dolan at Madison Square Garden. And one of the things we're excited about, the Knicks have become, uh, and, and I'm sure the fans can appreciate this, very representative and competitive this year. Yeah. What's been your thoughts of this current Nick team? Well, they, 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 they've got young played and, and, and with, uh, with the coach, um, uh, he's it's done an excellent yeah. job. He's playing tremendous defense and, and uh, uh, then, and I, I, I don't think, I, I don't think they're a championship team, but I think they're, they're on their way and with the right, choices in the future I, I think they'll they'll be right back in the running in the in the coming years a couple more questions for you uh the fallback baby jumper nickname <laughs> who, who bestowed that nickname on you or where did it come from that, 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 that's from the playground i knew when i shot that it was going in so we could fall back okay <laughs> <laughs> fall fall back baby hey, exactly to it to it now add this to that soliloquy mm -hmm. too late fall back baby <laughs> Never to be duplicated. You know, that was one jump shot that you, to this day, you do not see that jump shot emulated in the NBA. Totally unique to Dr. Dick Barnett. Last question for you, Dr. Barnett. How would you like to be remembered? What, what would be the, the legacy of, of Dr. Dick Barnett? Um, I, um, um, uh, as, I, as I indicated in, in that little rap that I gave, making a, a, a contribution and helping black people step back on the stage of history as free, proud, and productive people. Dr. Dick Barnett, I, I thank you so much for your time, uh, for all your contributions to this society, both on the court and off the court, uh, going through, as you said, some of the toughest times in our history and, and keeping your head held high and achieving nevertheless, always pursuing your dreams. Uh, those five principles this is definitely something that that i'll be writing down and, and taking forward as i pursue my passions as well so uh, i absolutely um and and grateful uh for your time today and hopefully we can get involved with the foundation down the road and, uh, and the fans as well. Casey. Look, looking forward to working with you thank you so much sir and, and enjoy the day thank you